people. People, people. You know, Zoli, what the problem is? The problem is not this one. The problem is the government decision limits the size of problem they can solve. Not just for outside companies and outside. So, so rather than being able to look at the world like this with open, like complete, like all 360, the rules of the government restrict the vision they can bring. And they only look at the world like tiny like this. And you realize that's not how innovation happens. And not just, not just in Europe, I'm thinking about China at the moment, I'm thinking about Russia at the moment. And I think that there is an, an approach taken up by the government where the tendency is to protect the current incumbents and, and, and to rule out other people or not allow them to do things or overtax them or, or, or completely ban them or, or, or things like that. And, and I think that that is one tendency that limits the imagination of the people in the country who are actually innovative, risk-taking, want to go out and do cool things. But this tendency to be very protective of what is there today actually stops progress for the future. And I see this in so many countries, and, and I'm quite sad by it. The other model that I see is that government takes a role of almost becoming an incubator of new ideas, incubator of new things. Uh, our friends in Singapore do that very well. I know Google has a gigantic building they've opened in London where they are having startups come and live and for free or whatnot. I have. Um, and, and, and what Google is doing is saying, actually, we have the privilege of having some money and we will be the incubator that allows innovation to flourish. And, and some of those people in that incubator are competitive to Google. They, they are creating products that will kill Google. And it's okay. It's okay, right? And, and they're not saying, let's figure out how to just protect what we have. Oh, we're, we're, we're country X, let's protect the people who are still running newspapers. Oh, we're country Y, let's protect the people who have done X, Y, or Z. I think that the protective tendency that comes in, because sometimes these industry and players are very well connected politically, and the politicians don't necessarily um, understand everything that is happening in space. Your role as a government is to incubate ideas. And what are you doing to incubate ideas? Ideas from your people, ideas from your universities, ideas from like, I don't want the government of France funding ideas in Spain. It's okay, right? But your own ideas. <laughs> The Jamaica event is not very far away, it's in May. Very close. Initially, the web and analytics was a, a very technical function, right? It was very IT driven. And eventually marketers found that they could have their nice reports on their own and pie charts in 3D with plenty of colors. You know, it was cool. I don't have to talk to IT anymore. I can get my nice little reports whenever I want. Right? And it worked for a while. Uh, marketers were able to optimize the traffic and those aspects. But, but now it's going far beyond that and it's about optimizing the, the whole business. And the business is not only marketing. Once we get over that, then everybody listens to us, we can help the company, we can get more budget, we can get more tools, we can get more people. But as long as we remain inside the Excel spreadsheet, it, it remains a problem. And that's, that seems to be the biggest threat to me. We're on a path to a collision between uh, the way marketers see analytics and the reality that there are business intelligence people and there are other people in the in, in uh, like data scientists, for example, uh, that are coming, and there will be there will be a collision at some point, right? So how good, how effectively organizations are going to be able to to uh, calibrate their team so that they can work end in end and not do as it was with marketing and IT, where it's almost like two different worlds. It can stay that way. I think that we have still tried to execute marketing with old mindsets, demographic, psychographic, uh, all these other crazy things we have. Um, I see progress in tools that are going to become smarter at allowing us to understand the intent of the person and be able to match that intent. This hasn't happened a lot, so I'm excited about that. Over a two-year horizon, one place that I have felt sad, we haven't made more progress, is the ability for us to do 
uh, content targeting on the website or the mobile app or mobile website. So at the moment, most of us still see the same site, even though our intent is so different. Yes, we do some A-B testing. We can switch things around. But, but I, I've always thought that what we need is a content management platform that understands all the signals that are available to people so that everybody sees a different version of the website. I, I visited the New York Times. I love the New York Times. I visit it all the time. And yet the home, change has ne home page has never changed for me. I only read three sections of the New York Times. Why do I still see the same homepage? Nobody's figured out how to uh, target intent on the site and the app and to make them learning, breathing, living experiences. And, and I think it's just that one hurdle has been, I believe, that companies don't have the ability to create content, content for all kinds of intent. It's easier to say, here's my one product page. It's got this specs, reviews, <laughs> pictures. That's, that's crazy. That's not how you might respond. You, I might respond a different way. So I, I, over the next two years, the thing that I'm excited about to answer your question over a little longer horizon is the development of content management systems that are so smart that we can do better targeting within the experience we have. We do targeting on Google. We do targeting on Yahoo. We do targeting on AOL. We do targeting on Terra and Baidu and Yandex. Why can't we target on our own website better? A few years ago, I was with all the social media marketers where they were very excited that now we can engage with our customers every day, we can have conversations, we can build a close relationship and things like that. And, and the thing that has proven to be false is, uh, well, all that. This, this is where I run into trouble with analysts and CMOs and people like that because I say that you should not measure social media just on conversion and just on that. All social media can do is expose your brand to people. You don't want to measure sales. You don't want to measure uh, how many people like you. That, that doesn't help you. Uh, but if you're just trying to gain awareness, ah, okay, you can measure that. If you want to, get, to measure how impactful your message is, okay, that's good. If you want to measure whether your activity on social media has an impact on how people perceive the company. Are you changing branding in the minds of the public? Yeah, you can do that. Can you make sales? In some cases, with some products, toward some target market uh, for a particular promotion? Sure, but that's, that's not a strategy. I think it's very hard for brands to figure out how to truly solve for the C intent cluster to truly be human, to truly be able to escape the trap of I need to convert everybody. And so, so, so what happened is, yes, all that promise existed. Meanwhile, brands did what brands do, which is go and shout at people, say, buy my stuff, you saw the biscuit this morning. Uh, and, and in the end, it turns out that these brands with an audience of millions of likes, that Hungarian brand had a million likes, two people are interacting with them. And so my view is that because brands have been proven to be so unsuccessful at it, the best way to do social media is the way that Facebook does it today, which is we're a platform where people gather and read about their friends and relationships and all these wonderful things. You should show display ads when people do that. You should show videos ads when people do that. And so in many ways, we have gone back to doing TV. We just do TV on Facebook now. There are some good signals that we get, but essentially all that promise about relationship, being closer, communicating, all that is dead. We basically do TV on social media now, and it's okay to think about it that way. The place where I think this is a little exception is channels like YouTube and Vimeo. So both places where we do video. People do want to be entertained, and there are brands that can entertain them, right? And when that happens, then I think video is a place where there has been a longer term success where you get subscribers who do watch your content repeatedly as you upload new videos. And in that sense, it's the TV model, but now where the brand is the producer of the TV content. And that has proven to be quite successful as well. But both of these are very different ways to do, think of social media than the original promise of social media. So much effort still goes into implementing and instrumenting the methods to collect data. What I really hope is that that becomes largely unnecessary because 
all of the frameworks for all this technology have inherent data layers or data capture or data vocabulary built into them. And we see that some already with certain you know, content management systems. There are some content management systems that will render a Google Tag Manager compliant data layer. Just You just click a button and it just speaks data layer. Well, imagine if, if core technologies that were being deployed uh, in all these different myriad of environments spoke data layer. Then we can just put software on top of it that reads that and sends it on to where it needs to go. That would be amazing for our industry. Um, and it would help us move from lots of work building the house and maintaining it to actually using it, living in it, doing analysis of the data, which is really where the value comes from. The traditional channel challenge we always had is, you know, our role is thought of as just reporting squirrels and people who puke data out. A bunch of it is the fault of our bosses and things who have these low expectations of us, but it's also a fault of our own because we obsess about these things. So I still think that this is a very big problem for our industry. And that is an inward looking problem. That is, we created it, we are going to solve it. That's why this morning in my keynote, I talked so much about moving away from analysis, from reporting squirrel to analysis. So I think this is a big problem. You and I need to go address it. And every analyst needs to address it. I've always so far separated um, the technology will collect data and provide information. If you use an info hierarchy, you have a pyramid with different layers, uh, data, information, knowledge, and then I put on top of that wisdom and action leading to value. So the technology is, has historically always done data collection and report generation. So collecting hits, processing it into a report. Um, and people have to do the knowledge, wisdom, and action. I think that we are moving into a new era where the technology is evolving and is actually going to be able to play a hand in more of that knowledge layer. Not just saying, here's the data, but saying, here's the data and, and here's some of what it means. It's still going to be up to us to decide to act on it, but I think there's going to be more automation technology that will, will kind of push the people higher up in that uh, hierarchy and um, make the process faster to get to ultimately Here's an insight, take an action on it, deliver some value. Using artificial intelligence to do a lot of the, the grunt work, the, the, the sh shovel work that we're doing now, the machine can do more and more of it so that we can be, uh, use our human capabilities better instead of spending so much time on data collection and data cleaning and data integration. There's a lot of that that can be automated. For example, I work in a, in a digital media agency and what do we see? We see that, you know, through automatization, through, uh, you know, um, uh, clients doing it themselves and other trends, you know, the, the margins are squeezing. So we need to be able to do programmatic, we need to automatize or work, you know, in order to be more efficient. Otherwise, we're, we're dead. We will still need to look over the shoulder of the machine and uh, decide whether the insights that it is presenting to us have any value or not and we are the ones who will have to decide to take the risk do we make the investment in this sort of marketing or that sort of marketing based on what the machine tells us of course we hear a lot of great stories uh, how such and such organization use data and they increase their conversion by a thousand percent right the reality in the field is that those are the exceptions. Everybody thinks, oh yeah, I'm gonna build a team. And uh, I, I've spoken with uh, some people here at the conference that are, that are also owners of their agencies or they work, you know, setting up a department of analytics. And they all tell me the same. It's a struggle to hire people qualified, not just qualified, but at least with potential, you know, because we can train them. But, you know, finding the, the persons is really hard. Marketing technologist or, or MarTech, you know, the, the kind of the hybrid between someone who has a strong marketing background and understand the business, but also is, you know, uh, uh, also understanding the technology up to a certain point, uh, the capacities and the, the features and the limits of different services and different technologies. I think that hybrid person is, is critical to, to bring change. And also one of the things that it's hard, it's to keep them. You need to feed them. 
not, not, not with food, but with challenges, with new things. Now if you put your people uh, to do the same thing over and over again, don't expect them to be there, you know, forever. And, uh, you know, I've seen many agencies that all of a sudden, wow, they lose a big part of their, of their uh, employees in analytics and they struggle. That the one that is easing, that is becoming a little easier, um, probably not for the next year, but may maybe a little, um, after a little while it'll be not a problem, but just this uh, ability um, to bring new people into our ecosystem and actually have all these amazing jobs that we have be filled by analysis ninjas. I think we continue to face a crunch with it um, and we don't have enough qualified people coming into it. So maybe what we need to do is to search those golden, you know, boys and girls that are out there doing other things in digital and, and, and enlighten them, you know, show them, you know, this is what you can do in analytics. This is what you can do with data. Don't you want to play with this? I hear different colleagues find something that they're passionate about and that they are expert in and can focus on that. And that becomes a part of the broader, um, I guess, story of our industry. Right? So some people may be focused on, on data privacy and ethics. Others may be focused on implementation and collection capabilities and tools. Others are working on how do we communicate with a business, right? Um, I think that it's important uh, that, that the digital analytics professional has a view of all of that, but they don't have to be expert in all of that. Um, so one thing that I'm taking away from this super week is um, I'm gonna go home and think about like, what do I really care about? What am I passionate about? And then choose that to focus on. Um, because then I can, then can shine in one area and be a part of the, the general um, industry and, and, and grow and, and make an impact on businesses and make an impact on, on the world in general. One of the problems that we have faced as an ecosystem, digital as an ecosystem, not, not a particular company, but, and not even analysts, but as an ecosystem, one of, the, one of the things is that we change at such crazy speed. You know, it's a, it's a challenge to, to build, a, to scale education, right? And that's one of the challenges because when there are so many people using Google Analytics, we have to find a way to scale education, to help people systematically understanding the tool, understanding the development and, you know, really understanding how to use it. The Digital Analytics Association is doing some wonderful things. Uh, first of all, we've come up with the competency framework that says, in analytics, here are the tasks that we perform. And for each task, here's the knowledge and the skills you need to do that task. Uh, and we've replicated that across uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, uh, technical versus analytics. Um, and against that, we've created a self-assessment tool that you can go onto the website and say, well, I can do these things and I want to learn those things. The pace of change, like every year there's a new blockbuster product and we're moving and we're changing and there's Snapchat and Facebook and WhatsApps and so many crazy things. Now, now we got the virtual reality, Oculus Rift. What do we do with it, right? So I think the problem with the pace of change we have is that we, we can't create textbooks, right? How do people teach today? We create textbooks. And there are no textbooks for the things that we do. Um, so uh, the pace of change creates a problem for educators because they like finite defined things and if everything changes all the time, how do they create textbooks? And, uh, by textbooks, I mean curriculum, etc. cetera, right? So, um, so I want to acknowledge that that, is, that, that that challenge exists, right? Because it's not just good to blame, you know, our educators and, you know, things like that. But some of the ideas that I think that are working is that I, 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 I have the great good luck to teach as a part of many MBA programs in the U.S. at Stanford and Virginia and UCLA and places like that. Um, I'm going to be teaching at Berkeley next month. Uh, and so I think that one great thing is that for many universities that are creating the next generation of CEOs and directors and VPs, they are reaching out to the industry and, and, and people such as myself and many, many, many others. And they're saying, why don't you come and teach the latest and greatest? We don't need a textbook. 
And so I can actually send them a blog post, I can send them a collection of, or I give them access to my GA data and I create some problems and I say go solve them. There's potential for predictive analytics that turns itself into, you know, real-time bid management and, you know, enterprise class decision making through, through machine learning. Um, that's, you know, one side of simple capabilities with, that we can use with technology. And data is, is what I like to say is the main ingredient in digital, you know, the, it's the main ingredient. So if you master data, you know, you, you, you have, you know, I won't say 90%, but you have a big percentage of the work done. So please master data. We are on the edge of the cliff, we're about, we haven't gone over it yet, but we're about to is continued proliferation of data. So many more different data sources, particularly with Internet of Things um, coming online in a much more real way. How do we as an industry deal with measuring that? Come on, let's be honest. For customers, it's one brand, one company. It's not about, oh yeah, I'm in touch with their, I don't know, call center or their chat through the web, or I'm emailing them, I'm seeing an advertising. So we need to pull all that together in order to be really customer centric and have a seamless, you know, experience throughout the channels. We're now moving into an era where the model of, oh, we're gonna track interactions, clicks on buttons, things loading, taps, scrolls, page loads, that's going away. Now it's digital interactions that could be on a screen, it could be with some other kind of device or sensor and data set. So how are we as an industry thinking about how are we going to collect that data in a way that is consistent with the other kinds of data we're collecting that can tell a comprehensive story about what the user is experiencing. So I, you know, as you know, I, I wrote a book on Google Analytics integrations. I think that integrating data or making sure that, you know, again, going back to the, to the uh, online customer journey, I think, you know, when we integrate data and we, when we make uh, uh, our systems more uh, comprehensive, I think uh, we move forward. So I, th I hope that this year we'll see, you know, more integration and more uh, uh, completeness on the data that we have access to. My digital experience with the company, uh, I think increasingly is gonna be not just multi-screen, but multi, device isn't really the right word, multi-faceted in a whole new kind of way where all of the things that I might buy are interconnected. Um, with each other and with the app and an experience I might have even in a physical or retail environment is, is augmented by these digital things that we interact with. And from a digital analytics standpoint, we need to measure all of that. The danger is we just start drowning ourselves in even more data and the, the, all the new data we collect isn't useful. So how do we plan data models and standards and approaches for collecting that data and integrating it into what we're already doing, I think, is a, is a challenge. If we fail to do that, we become less relevant. And that's bad. That's a problem. Some of the main things that came up as recurring themes for, for threats or challenges were really around privacy and ethics. So um, I think that as the world is becoming more and more aware of how data is playing a role in individuals' lives because of the nature of targeting because of the nature of um, that everyone's on mobile devices and they're within digital, I think that there's going to become more of an awareness that, hey, what's happening with all this data? So I think that the biggest challenge to our role in terms of data collection and, and using data in a meaningful and useful way um, is going to begin to clash against maybe some people who aren't using data in a way that um, is quite okay or within the comfort zone of, of individuals. I've been working with a couple of companies on trying to find a privacy business model. Um, it's not easy, um, so I did that in, in the mobile application sector with an with Israeli company. It's, it's a challenge. Having said that, our, our industry is based also on this idea of competing on analytics. So I don't know if you know the, the book by Thomas Davenport a couple of years back. Um, and this, this idea of competing on privacy is certainly starting to emerge. 
Um, I think certainly also when it comes to analytics vendors, they have an interesting role to play to present features that are privacy friendly so that their clients can respect the privacy rights of their, their consumers, their customers. Um, so it's an entire data ecosystem that is starting to think about this idea of competing on privacy. So it can become an economic differentiator. The biggest threat for me continues to be this tension between our ability to understand people at a person level, usually, um, versus the government's ability to allow us to do these kinds of things. There's a lot of good concerns. There are some um, uh, uh, suboptimal concerns that are not valid in this space. But this idea that there is a lot of uh, scrutiny concern limitations uh, 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 that are just in the, our ability to capture data and understand it. And I think that this problem is, is going to get a little worse before it gets better, I, I have to admit. It still feels kind of like a bit of a hot potato. Nobody really wants to, to own it and we're not really sure who, who's going to uh, take on the burden and responsibility for regulation of digital privacy um, in the United States. And it's more from a regulation perspective, not, not our ability to do it, but from a regulation perspective. I think, and, and you and I are not lawyers, and we don't, are not politicians, thank God. Um, those people will solve that problem, if at all. But I do worry that um, it limits our ability to understand people we interact with, and it, it put limitation on our ability to then deliver relevance to them. Because if I don't understand you, any piece of content, marketing, whatever I deliver to you is not going to be relevant. And, and it does impede progress. You just think about our ability to truly transform relationships with our customers using mobile apps. I, gi I gave a few examples today, right? And, and I'm afraid that actually that is getting limited by the data we can collect. Limited by our ability to understand the person and their behavior so we can be of more value to them. So, so that's one I, I worry about quite a bit. I was here two years ago as well, discussing the same theme and trying to evangelize about issues related to data and ethics. Um, and everybody was like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting to see how in the last 18 months, two years, um, this, this topic has raised um, to board level discussions. I think privacy is going to be uh, a topic that will finally get uh, a fair share of attention. Uh, that and uh, maybe it relates to that also uh, ad blockers. Uh, I think it will reach a point where um, it already, I think it, it has already reached a point where it has an impact for marketers. Uh, and the risk of uh, all of those big data combination and, and harvesting the data and, and like there will be some mistakes and accidents and leakage of, of data and stuff like I'm sure it's going to happen. So the European Union started um, a revision of their stances and, and legislation related to privacy in 2012. And the final text on the European Data Protection Regulation um, was agreed between the different parties of so the European Commission, the Parliament, um, and, um, and the, the, the initial text um, at the end of last year. So in December, before Christmas, there was finally a final text under the Christmas tree related to the Data Protection Regulation, uh, which is going to replace um, the, the Privacy Directive. The thing is, for our industry, um, we've been discussing a lot about cookies and cookie walls um, since 2011, following the e-privacy directive, the revision of the e-privacy directive. And this is up for revision again as well. So the European Data Protection Regulation talks a bit about the e-privacy directive, uh, but it still needs to be revised as well. Uh, but clearly the, the, the sentiment is changing. I think on both sides of the Atlantic, not only Europe, but also the United States, people are getting to grasp with the, this idea that data is good for economic growth, but it also can create harm for citizens. We have to always be, uh, uh, I don't know if I would say concerned, but we have to be very uh, attent to it and, and be sure that you know, we are respecting our users and that you know, everything is done with you know, ultimate security. It has to be very secure and very private. And you know, that's what I see 
happening at Google. We you know, treat data very seriously and we know that you know, it's a very important matter. So I think you know, we, we are going in the right direction. And I think it's very important you know, in conference like Super Week where we discuss you know, what privacy concerns users have and you know, businesses have and you know, what should be the way forward. So I think you know, these kind of discussions that we had this week, they're very important to you know, drive the industry forward. I'm optimistic about it. You have to be. If you have young children, you have to be optimistic about the future. It, it's evolving. You know, when you talked about data ethics three years ago, everybody was like, you oh, know, big data, you know, we're collecting as much as we can and things like that. But there are different, different um, things at play in the industry. Um, open source movements, for example, which is interesting as well, playing an important role when it comes to data ethics. Um, so I, I'm optimistic about, about the future, about the evolution, and, and I'm seeing it here also. People want to talk about it. It doesn't mean we, we have all the answer, and that's fine. Uh, we, we need to start thinking about it, and even if we build something that's not perfect, we need to start the road, and we can do that together. And I think that's the interesting challenge for 2016 and 2017. As an industry, I always can um, take a step ahead, and I think we have now an imperative that we really, really must um, really push forward to be much clearer on, on the points that they said were important to them, the things that they're thinking about. Um, it, are you being transparent in what you're doing to the, with the consumer uh, so that they know about it? Um, are you collecting data, processing, and storing it in a way that is secure? Is it protected? And does the consumer have a choice in um, how their data is used or collected or to not be collected. Um, so those three things being tenants, I always kind of think of how can we future-proof ourselves to uh, uncertainties about the future. And it seems like that's the playbook um, right there. If you think about how do you better serve your customers in a way that is transparent, secure, and provides them choice, um, you're going to go in a direction where you're not doing the kinds of things that could come under legislative or regulatory issues, and you're going to go in a direction that's ethical and good for your end customers, which is good for your business. So I think that's something that uh, really, at least in my view, is coming up as a highlight for this year, is um, as an industry, we just need to get a lot more serious about maintaining privacy, security, um, those tenants of transparency, choice, and, and security of data. The risks are, are increasing, so um, and it's, it's also the reason why it's becoming a board level discussion. Um, so, so last year and certainly since 2012, data breaches and security was the main risk. Um, but well, you know, you had a data breach and you know, you contact, contact your customers and, uh, and but today we're talking about other types of risks, which are fines, certainly, um, which is where the European Data Protection Regulation comes in with a revision of fines that can go up to 4% of global turnover. Different countries have different rules. So how does that apply to a um, pan-national company? A company that's doing business in many different places and they have a single unified data collection setup, if the the rules and legislation about how that data is either allowed to be collected or, or used uh, differs by locality. That's going to be that's going to be a very challenging thing for for a company to um, navigate in terms of their policy and execution. I think also consumer trust. Uh, Vodafone came out with an interesting survey about online and the trust of consumers, which is very low for online when it comes to privacy. So I think as an industry, we certainly have a, a role to play related to that. Um, I'm also calling on, on all analytics people in the measurement industry to share data ethics policies, if there are any, within your, your, your company or your government, to take a look at what's out there and what can we build in terms of data ethics, what would be you know common standard that we can suggest on, on both sides of the Atlantic, not just Europe, uh, listening to the United States as well. So I think the, there is a definitely a heavier regulatory burden in Europe than in the United States right now. Um, and I think that makes, I, I would say that actually puts European companies at somewhat of a disadvantage because they have to comply with more. Um, 
However, uh, I think the bigger topic is what is right for the end customer and for as a business for your customers. And I think that where Europe has gone and, and continues to go is, is really in a pursuit of wanting to do right by the people. And I think that's always a good pursuit. So uh, in the US, I think we've just been a lot more sluggish about that. And I, I, I might even venture out to say that's a problem uh, at this point, that, that we really ought to be thinking ahead. It, there's news every week or every month, it seems, about big data breaches. And I think those those are very different than what we do in the digital analytics industry for the most part. A, a database of customer information for health information, healthcare for example, getting hacked into or the government database of all the records for federal employees. We're not dealing with that kind of data in digital analytics. That being said, the data that we do deal with still should be protected, made secure, and consumers should know what's happening and be able to choose what degree they want to participate or not. And that choice might even mean they have to say, no, I'm not gonna use a certain platform. Like maybe people don't like what Facebook does with data, so they could choose not to use Facebook. Um, so I think there's, there's already some inherent choice, but I, I don't think it's, as, it's good enough yet. So there is like a triangle that needs to work together. So um, the private companies in the analytics sector, us as well as, as actors of this, Consumers and citizens who are showing their, their votes through using ad blocking technology, for example, and then legislation. Um, and so the European Union has moved uh, aggressively, I think, on, on this theme, also because we have it enshrined in our fundamental rights, the right to privacy, um, and created a European Data Protection Supervisor, which has recently announced a board of data ethics, people who are going to discuss about data ethics, which I'm part of. So the conversation is growing. Um, I think it's important to get all stakeholders around the table. Uh, it's not just the law that needs to impose something, but we need to align together. And these kinds of conferences allow to get these people around the table, uh, talk about it, uh, think about new ways of data governance, think about new ways to align with legislation. I'm very grateful for that. And then the conversation continues. Um, so. My hope is that the conversation can continue from this conference to other conferences um, and within the just general, you know, online community that we share. It's, it's great when you have uh, time and peace to talk to people about, you know, everything that is going on. The breadth of, uh, of the discussions were very interesting. And, you know, also the fact that uh, there is such a, a large expert community that comes to Super Week. And not only experts, but, you know, we see people from with different levels of expertise, which, you know, I think enriches the, the discussions as well, because we see what's coming up. And so it has been really interesting to, you know, have time to, to discuss analytics in, you know, such a nice environment with snow and fire and uh, mulled wine. It was, it was really a great and I had a lot of fun. Up in the mountains, this looks like a, like a retreat of analysts for a week. It's really marvelous. And, and we had the snow. You rarely get the chance to just openly chat with other people. And of course we talk about, about our work, but you also get to know other aspects of the people in the industry. Uh, what, you know, do they have kids? Uh, what they like to do outside of the work? And, and I think that's important also because it makes it more uh, human. Yeah, it's not, we're always data driven, but beyond the data there are people. Right. And that aspect is something I think very unique at Super Week. Best Super Week yet. So it was really great to see the community come together again as, as it has for the last several years. Um, but, but having um, Jim Stern join us this year was I think really special to have him um, to be here and be part of this community and this event. This is a smaller conference in, in numbers of people but it feels very close and so much great information and knowledge in a beautiful environment and setting that you really just can't get anywhere else in the world. So it's been fun. Great to see such a, um, a gathering of, of, of friends and, um, and smart professionals and openness, an openness to discussion and, and, and help with each other. So I think that that was, if we just see more of this, more Super Weeks.